turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, and while you're turning there, I'm just going to put Graham and Sarah on notice. We're going to sing the gospel song at the very end of the service here a couple of times, all right? Matthew 9. When I go to Kenya, I most often borrow a vehicle from a friend and, and drive myself and our team to the places we need to go, even though I know that when I do so, I'm taking a calculated risk. That's because Kenya police officers seem to love to target vehicles whose drivers have white faces. And so almost every time I'm there, I get pulled over by a traffic policeman. It, it happened on the last day of my recent trip a month or so ago. It's happened more than once with Debbie Sardo in the car. It happened when Dan Tuggy was with me. And when I lived in Kenya, it happened frequently when I was driving with my family. One time I was driving through town when suddenly a scowling man dressed in a starched blue uniform and a white cap stepped into the road and signaled me to stop with one arm and motioned me to pull over with the other. After doing so, he slowly, methodically walked around the vehicle looking for anything that might possibly be wrong. Then he swaggered up to the driver's window and demanded to see my license. He inspected it long and hard. And finally, his eyes lit up and and then began to blaze. You have committed a major crime. Making sure to emphasize the word major. I'm going to arrest you and and take you to the police station. I, I, uh, I resisted the impulse to correct him and say, you mean I'll be taking you to the police station? because the traffic police in Kenya do not have vehicles. And so when you are arrested, you must drive yourself and the officer to the station. But I had learned the hard way that the last time I played hardball with these guys, uh, I'd ended up in a 20-foot by 20-foot cell with 69 other lawbreakers. As politely as I could, I asked the officer what was wrong. He thrust my driver's license in front of my face, and I looked at the picture. Sure enough, it was me. I I looked at the expiration date. Sure enough, it was valid. I I don't see a problem, officer. Your signature is nowhere to be found, he shouted, and that is a major crime. So I offered to borrow his pen and sign it in his presence and be done with it, but he would have none of it. Instead, he spent the next 20 minutes reminding me how much trouble I was in, and then in hushed tones asked me how we were going to remedy the situation. Of course, he was looking for a bribe, and I knew it, though I pretended I did not know it. I kept asking him to explain what he meant. More recently, I have changed my tactics when dealing with these slippery officers. When they pull me over and then fabricate a violation that I've just committed, as they did on my recent trip, and then threaten me with a court appearance, jail time, and a large fine, as they did on my recent trip, I I just sit there looking ignorant and confused until they say in hushed tones, now, what can we do about it? And then I say, what do you mean? They say, well, well, you know, what, what can we do about it? And I'll say loud enough so that as many people as possible can hear, you you mean you're asking for a bribe? No, 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 no. And after going back and forth for about 20 minutes, they finally weary of their game and let me go, knowing that I'll never pay the bribe. Now, 
I'm not sure there's anything that riles me more than when men use their position of influence or authority to exploit innocent people who are just going about their business. I, I feel... I, I feel disdain for those men. I, I want those men to be exposed and, and humiliated. And so when I'm around them, I, I tend not to treat them with respect. I, uh, I ignore them or I, or I give them a look of contempt. I'm not proud of that attitude, by the way. Especially after studying the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. My attitude that I just described is totally incompa incompatible with Jesus' attitude towards such men. In fact, I discovered that my attitude is downright pharisaical, and you'll see what I mean in a moment here. When Jesus was on earth, he was called a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That was a derogatory label intended to indict him for hanging out with people, some of whom, tax collectors, had a reputation for abusing their authority by exploiting innocent people. But Jesus reminded the people who called him that name that these were the very people for which he came to this earth. Take a look at Matthew's story in verse 9 of chapter 9. As Jesus passed on from there, this is the house where he had healed the paralytic, presumably Peter's house, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now Matthew, of course, is the author of this gospel. And so he's giving here an autobiographical account of how he came to be a disciple of Jesus. When he encountered Jesus on this day, he was sitting at a tax booth. That meant he was a tax collector. In the first century Palestine, tax collectors were representatives of the Roman Empire. They were specifically appointed and employed by Herod, who was Rome's ruling monarch in the region. These tax collectors, most of them Jews, were required to collect tolls and duties for the Roman authority. Now, Galilee was a heavily trafficked trade route, and, and tolls were extracted from commercial caravans that passed through the regions. But taxes were also collected from the local population, and, and Herod was extremely efficient in obtaining revenue from as many sources as possible. He even collect, ta collected taxes for fish caught in the Sea of Galilee. This tax revenue was a heavy burden for the people of Galilee who already had difficult lives. And so they resented Rome and Herod for what they perceived to be excessive extortion. But whatever resentment the Jews felt toward Rome, it was magnified exponentially toward Jewish citizens who worked for Rome and collected their taxes. That's because tax collectors did not get paid a salary, but worked on commission. They earned their income by charging extra, and they had the freedom to impose an arbitrary amount on individuals who passed through their booths. And so they might charge one person two shekels, give one to Rome and put one in their pocket. They might charge the next person three shekels, give one to Rome and put two in their pocket. And the people couldn't do a thing about it. They were at the mercy of the tax collector's moods and whims. 
So, besides being considered traitors, tax collectors were hated and despised because tax because they notoriously exploited their own people for self-serving ends. People felt about them what I often feel about those traffic officers, indignant for abusing their authority. Besides this, tax collectors also violated one of the most sacred laws in the Jewish community. They worked on the Sabbath thus rendering them ceremonially unclean. Because of these things, tax collectors had their own social category in the first century. They were wealthy people, but their wealth gave them no status or prominence. They were despised, shunned, excluded from the Jewish community, and excommunicated from the synagogue. So in these days, if you wanted to use a slur that would disgrace a person, you might call a woman a whore and a man a tax collector. Tax collectors were in the same social category as prostitutes, adulterers, and drunkards. Matthew's tax booth was probably located where a well-traveled road called the Via Maris passed close to the shore on the outskirts of Capernaum. And it was there that Jesus encountered him. Whether Jesus and Matthew were friends prior to this, we do not know. Though it's likely they were at least acquainted since Jesus was a resident of Capernaum and would have traveled this route many times before. We do know that when Jesus calls out to him, follow me, he was doing something that no ordinary respectable teacher or religious leader would dare to do in that day. He was extending an invitation and initiating a relationship with a notorious sinner who was known and despised by everyone in that region. And yet knowing this, knowing how it would affect his own reputation and credibility, Jesus invited Matthew to become one of his inner circle of friends. And I assure you, this invitation was calculated. Matthew had been deliberately chosen to be in this exceptionally privileged position of being Messiah's close companion. And this was his summons. And notice, there is no indication that Matthew sat down with Jesus and negotiated the terms of this proposition. Nor is there any evidence that he asked any questions. The text merely says that when Jesus said to him, follow me, he rose and followed him. It's important to know that from a purely human perspective, Matthew's decision to accept the call to follow Jesus came with an immediate cost, a financial cost. He would have had to leave his lucrative income as an employee of Rome. And while a fisherman could always go back to fishing if things didn't work out, a tax collector could not return to his booth. Matthew understood that he would be taking a substantial pay cut, which would significantly lower his standard of living. He understood that he would no longer be able to enjoy the lifestyle and amenities to which he had been accustomed. More importantly, he was relinquishing the right and the freedom to make his own choices and govern his own life. Jesus was now his Lord. And he was submitting his daily activities, his schedule, his finances, his plans, and his future. To Jesus. 
Brothers and sisters, that's the cost of discipleship. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And for some of us, like Matthew, this means forsaking our standard of living, our lifestyle, perhaps even our livelihoods, if they conflict with his call upon our lives. Because when Jesus calls us, he calls us to a life of devotion and obedience to him. We are no longer the boss of our own lives who do whatever we want to do. We now take our marching orders from Jesus Christ, our Lord. We go where he tells us to go. We do what he tells us to do. That's discipleship. I I don't know about you, but I get weary of people who, in their testimonies, Talk about all the things they gave up to be a follower of Christ. I gave up Hollywood. I gave up my career as a professional athlete. I gave up a million dollar a year business. Listen, we give up nothing to become followers of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We give up nothing to become ambassadors of Jesus Christ, sons and daughters of Almighty God, partakers of the divine nature, partners in the kingdom. And I think Matthew understood that. When Jesus issued this call, it was a promotion. (laughs) And he did not hesitate. He got up, left everything, and followed Jesus immediately. And if there's one thing Matthew was aware of in this call, it was that the grace of God had been extended to him. Remember, Matthew was not a righteous man. He had engaged in behavior that had violated God's law, exploited God's people, incurred God's displeasure. And so he must have been shocked when Jesus invited him, a sinner, to his inner circle of friends, he was undoubtedly filled with gratitude and joy. Because the first thing he did was throw a party at his home with Jesus as his guest of honor. Look at verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. I'd like you to try to imagine what this was like. Here you have a a wealthy yet utterly despised man in the community pulling out all the stops hosting a big reception for his new friend. And yet because of his reputation, he was not able to attract any dignitaries or or honorable people to this affair. And so he invited those who would come, his fellow outcasts. The place is full of tax collectors and sinners. That term, sinner, was also a derogatory label in that day, used used to identify a segment of people who willfully crossed the boundaries of appropriate Jewish behavior as expressed in the law. And so this gathering of people likely included those who were known adulterers, prostitutes, drunkards, Sabbath breakers, These were the lowlife. These were those who were considered the moral scum of the community. And yet we are told that Jesus was reclined at the table with them. Notice, he wasn't 
standing on or behind the table with eyes flashing, pointing his fingers and condemning them for their behavior. He is in their midst, eating, drinking, conversing. And since he was the guest of honor, he probably was right in the middle so that he could be the central focus of the conversation and celebration. And and this is significant because in the ancient world to dine with someone was an expression of goodwill and friendship. It was a means of identifying with a person or group and embracing them. So Jewish people in this day most often dined with those and only those who shared their beliefs, their values, their morals, their interpretations. Pharisees ate with Pharisees. Essenes ate with Essenes. Sadducees with Sadducees. No Jew, by the way, would ever eat with a Gentile. And no self-respecting Jew would eat with members of the group known as sinners. And so when Jesus is seen eating and drinking with this crowd, some of those who observed were appalled. Look at verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? And sinners. Remember, Pharisees were the re- religious VIPs in Jesus' day, the most venerated and highly esteemed sect in Judaism. They were the experts in the law the epitome of religiosity, the strictest of the strict. Their name means separated ones. And they understood separation to be their moral obligation. To separate themselves from anything unclean, which included tax collectors and sinners. You can imagine then their bewilderment when they saw Jesus and his disciples eating and drinking at Matthew's house. How could he recline at the same table with these people? How could he engage in an activity that signified he was identifying with them and that he was their friend? This could only mean, from their point of view, that Jesus condoned their behavior. But Jesus who either overheard their complaints to the disciples or knew what was in their hearts, said to them, verse 12, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. The purpose of a physician is to provide the necessary treatment so that sick people are able to get well. But in order for sick people to get that treatment, they must actually know that they are sick. They must seek help from a physician. Because a physician is of no use to sick people if they cannot be in his presence. In other words, a physician helps those who cannot help themselves. And no, they cannot. And then they come to him for treatment. We'll come back to that in a moment. But look at verse 13 where Jesus continues. Go, he says to the Pharisees, and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. By using the metaphor of a doctor in verse 12, Jesus is comparing himself to a physician. He's the healer of a sickness called sin. And he has come to help sinners who cannot help themselves. 
and no, they cannot. The Pharisees, on the other hand, lived with the attitude, God helps those who help themselves. You make yourself righteous by obeying the law and fulfilling the requirements of the Old Testament. Which is why Jesus quoted from the book of Hosea in verse 13, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Ah, the Pharisees were very familiar with that passage. Sacrifice in that context is a reference to all of the religious rituals that the people were performing in that day that God pronounced empty because they were not accompanied by compassion and mercy. Jesus is reminding the Pharisees That God has always had a soft spot for the outcast, the marginalized, the low life, the people that the Pharisees indignantly categorized as sinners. You see, for Jesus, a sinner was not merely someone who violated the law. A sinner is someone who lives in opposition to God's will. And that included not just the behavior of those dining with Jesus, but the attitudes and behavior of the Pharisees who disdained those people. In this statement, Jesus was pointing out that the Pharisees were blind to their own sinfulness. Therefore, he continues, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. When Jesus used the metaphor of a physician in verse 12, he was implying that if a doctor is going to be of use to sick people, he has to be in contact with them. Our Dr. Bob an orthopedic surgeon, is not in in the habit of going to the mall, stopping people at random and saying, excuse me, do you have any bone issues? Got any broken bones? If so, I'd be happy to examine them. But suppose Dr. Bob came upon the scene of an accident where there was a person lying on the road with a broken arm and leg and some spinal injury. Wouldn't he have an obligation, given his knowledge and skill and expertise, to stop and assist that person? Listen, Jesus is the physician of sinners. He heals people from their sin. That's his skill. That's his expertise. But the only way he can exercise that skill is when he is in contact with sinners. Jesus knew who he was having dinner with. He knew their spiritual and moral condition. And I'm pretty sure the guests dining with him knew their own condition as well. Which is why their host, Matthew, invited them in the first place. He had experienced Jesus' mercy and grace earlier in the day. He wanted his friends to experience it as well. Make no mistake. Jesus does not condone sin. Jesus does not approve of sinful behavior and sinful attitudes and, and sinful thoughts. Sin grieves him far more than it grieved the Pharisees and teachers of the law. But Jesus came because he knew that sinners cannot help themselves. They need a Savior. When Jesus called Matthew a notorious tax collector, Jesus was making a bold statement about his mission. That he had come to bring healing to a sin-sick world. When he dined with Matthew's friends, 
he was making a bold statement about who he had become to befriend, who he had come to befriend, and who he had come to identify with. His salvation is not for righteous people who think that God helps themselves those who help themselves. His salvation is for those who cannot help themselves and know that they can't. And perhaps the reason Jesus chose Matthew and not a Pharisee to be part of his inner circle is because in order to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to recognize your sin and then be cured by the sin doctrine. Listen, sin is not cured by religion, as the Pharisees thought. Sin is a spiritual sickness that must be honestly acknowledged to be incurable by one's own attempts at religious righteousness. Sin can only be cured by the great physician. That great physician had reached out to Matthew to cure his sin. And Matthew, in turn, invited his sinner friends to meet the one who could cure them as well. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Jesus is the friend of sinners. And that includes you and me. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his incredible love, wisdom, power. Thank you for his grace and mercy. Lord, thank you that you have made us the recipients of that grace and mercy. We praise you, dear Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.